Thank you very much indeed uh, to Mark and to the team. Dr. Stanley Craig is a consultant as a neonatologist in the Belfast Trust. And Dr. Mark Harbison is a consultant in cardiology, also in the Belfast Trust, and a senior lecturer in Queen's University in Belfast. Please give them both a very warm welcome. Stanley, did I get that terminology right? Yes, neonatologist. Um, it's a wonderful word. What does it mean? Um, it's, a, it's a subspecialty of uh, paediatrics, child health, um, that involves uh, the particular specialty of looking after uh, ill newborn infants. Okay. So, uh, the, the bread and butter type of, of uh, patient that, that comes through our place would be uh, somebody who is born preterm or unexpectedly unwell um, just after birth or have some form of congenital abnormality that requires intervention or surgery. Thank you. And Mark, um, in your cardiology, do you only work with old people or do you also work with young people and babies? So the majority of my work is with uh, an adult population and a predominantly slightly older population. I see anybody from 18 onwards, but the majority of the work is probably in the sort of 60 to 80 category. And a cardiologist who looks after um, the, the uh, uh, small infants, is, what would that be called? So we've got paediatric cardiologists who specialise in paediatrics and cardiology, and um, I give them all a very difficult job. Okay, now you think that the preacher uses big words in theology. <laughs> there we go, the whole new language in the medical realm, but thank you for explaining those so very well. Do you know each other? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've known each other for some years. <laughs> and, I think I was a year ahead of market school. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, yes, we went to the same school as well, and Stan's wife Claire was in my year at Queen's, so we've known each other for a, a long time. Okay, so Mark, you were also in the same form as my wife Claire right. at Sullivan Upper, That's and right. uh, uh, Stan, we first met when you were studying medicine in Aberdeen. That's right, yeah. And I was a theological student. Um, so that's a long time ago, isn't it? Yes, back in the days when I had thin and you were less grey. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us what you've um, been doing since then, Stan. You're a member of Knock Congregation. Uh, yes, I've been going along to Knock for about uh, seven or eight years now. Um, since I left uh, medical school in Aberdeen, I worked in Scotland for a while. And then I came back and I've done most of my paediatric training here in Northern Ireland but also for uh, some time down in Dublin. And um, I specialised in paediatrics and then subsequently in neonatology. Okay, and everybody here is very nosy, so they'd like to know a wee bit about your family. Okay, I'm married to Claire. Claire's a GP down in Hollywood Archers Health Centre. Um, and uh, she practices under Craig as well, so she's a Dr. Craig as well. And I have uh, three daughters, uh, 15, 13 and 11. Okay. Just on the transfer test. Very good. All right. <laughs> and uh, Mark, um, you're, you're more familiar to, to many, but some won't know you, so, so would you do the same? Yes, well, I'm married to Andrew, who's just there, and um, we've got three children. We've got Rachel, who's seven, we've got Simon, who's four, and we've got Philip, who's two. And uh, Andrew and I have been coming to this congregation since we got married about nine years ago. Um, before that, I went to Belmont uh, Presbyterian, and then I lived in London for a couple of years and went to All Souls. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Now, what you've said to us, you're, you're both dealing with, in some senses, the opposite end of the age spectrum, but there are some things that, some issues that are remarkably similar. Um, Stan, let's say uh, you have an extremely premature baby, uh, maybe a baby that's on the margins of viability, um, how do you make a decision pertaining to an issue such as resuscitation? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's always an emotionally uh, charged uh, situation if things are, are unexpected. Um, occasionally, um, we do get time to spend with, with uh, uh, the mum just to explain um, what's likely to happen, um, what the um, 
types of, of illness that the baby's going to face, um, make some sort of assessment as to um, just how mature um, the, the, the baby's going to be, uh, and then try and give the mum some uh, information as to um, likely response to, uh, to resuscitation. Um, at and around the, the margins of viability, and by that um, I mean sort of 23, 24 uh, weeks gestation, so 16, 17 weeks early. Um, sometimes babies don't respond to, uh, to resuscitation, um, and often they um, declare very quickly um, how physically able or uh, are they mature enough to be able to actually respond appropriately. Um, so, in our preparation for that, we, tr we try and explain in as easy to understand terms as possible to mum and dad what, is, what we're going to try and do. Sometimes mums and dads say, it's okay, you know, we, we don't want that to, to happen because um, unfortunately in, in, in many instances um, in our attempts to um, resuscitate and, and keep babies alive, um, there can be things which uh, lead to, to long-term handicap and that can be very uh, difficult uh, to predict uh, and certainly very tip, uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to manage and to uh, work our way through. So in, in many ways, it, it, you have to take each situation, each family, each, each, each patient um, as they come. And I don't come with hard and fast rules. Um, but I come with honesty um, and uh, try and explain things in um, a level of understanding, you know, with, with, with words and to make sure that, that, that uh, parents know what it is they're about to face uh, so that they can um, have some in input in terms of, of um, what we do and, and how far we go. Sometimes we can't go very far, sometimes we can. I mean, Stanley, the sort of thing you're describing here is very, it's just a, a potent mix because you have got your professional um, analysis of the situation. You are also emotionally involved with the parents and, and where they're coming from. And also you have issues pertaining to faith. Do, do you find that your Christian faith comes into this either positively or negatively? Um, I, I think that it hopefully pervades all that, all that I do. Um, honesty is, uh, is, is absolutely uh, paramount, um, and that's not obviously solely um, a, a, a Christian value. It is a, it's, it's ultimately what, what uh, my defence union says and the GMC says I have to be, etc. Um, but I think, I, I think having a way of, of explaining things and trying to get um, alongside uh, folks, uh, rather than being the cold professional who has to do the cold professional job, um, I try and you know bring a, a, a humanity or, or, or a warmth um, to uh, to that situation, um, and I think my my Christian faith helps me to get alongside people because they're clearly people who are in a very vulnerable and distressing situation, um, and. Um, I think compassion is something that is really vitally important uh, for me as a Christian in that situation. So I have to maintain, you know, my professional uh, approach and honesty and so on. But I, th I think where my Christian faith uh, comes through is is in is in compassion um, and the the gentle gentleness um, with which you approach people. Mark, a lot of the issues are very similar for you. Yes. Absolutely. I, I, excuse me, I definitely agree with what Stan said there, particularly about caring and compassion being sort of central in these very difficult situations. I guess the main practical difference between our two situations is that in general I'm dealing with an adult patient, so many of the difficult conversations I'm having are actually with the person concerned themselves rather than with the parents on behalf of the of the child um, and again it's a very difficult situation uh, I think 
my experience in, in these situations has been that many people have some idea themselves of the situation in which they find themselves and sometimes as a healthcare professional you have some trepidation, rightly so, about entering such difficult places in people's lives. But actually many people I find actually are quite open and would prefer that there's no pretense or anything hidden and a lot of people want to want to have an open and, and, and honest discussion. And again, it's how you say things as much as what you say that I think is terribly important in these circumstances. Now, most, most people know that doctors' tasks is, is about life, about human life, but you're talking about issues pertaining to death, yes. and those are profoundly uh, significant issues for Christian professionals. I mean, I think if you believe that man has created an image of God and that God cares deeply uh, for everyone, then you've got to have a certain view of uh, what a person is. And that really colours, I think, how you approach all aspects of not just the very difficult issues around death, but of course all the issues around caring. If, if that's your starting position, then that's a sort of compass for how you should manage these situations, I think. I'm going to take you a little step further and to another aspect of your work, um, Mark, particularly, because not only are you a consultant in a hospital, but you're also working with students and you're teaching students. And medical um, um, issues, they're always changing. And sure. the, the scientific um, advances mean that there are things happening now that didn't happen a number of years ago. Those also raise ethical issues. Would you like to highlight maybe some of the current ethical issues that we need to know about? Well, this is a very difficult area, uh, as you say, Frank, and in many areas the science has moved much more quickly than the ethical thinking has moved, so a lot of things that stand was more about than I do around reproductive technology and all of those things. Actually, the science has moved much more quickly than we as a society have had a chance to actually think about what we're doing. So because we can do it, it has been done and we haven't quite caught up with some of the, the ethical thinking. I think some of the things that are not impacting yet, but probably will, I think are around. I'm sorry to come back to death again, but uh, physician-assisted suicide um, and euthanasia um, are subjects that are coming to the fore again in the last few years, and there's been quite a lot of literature around this, and there's been um, a variety of pressure groups set up with quite a few different positions. And I think with the students, while we want to teach them knowledge and the things they need to know to be doctors, we also want to teach them about attitudes and we want to teach them about values and the things that they will be able to draw on in every situation, even when perhaps the facts may change and the knowledge may, be, may change. You must have some sort of framework in which you can assess things as they happen. And I think that's one of our jobs. So Mark, um, if somebody were to say to you, as perhaps they have done, you know, if I reach a, a stage in my life where the quality of life is so difficult, uh, just give me an injection and, and that will be it. Yes. Well, this is a very difficult subject. Um, there are things called advanced directives in which you can, when you're well, you can make a provision for how you're managed when you become unable to decide for yourself and those do carry some legal weight. So. Aside from the ethical issues, there's also uh, a legal issue about how we, do, how we deal with these things. I think, I think the big problem um, uh, in these circumstances is trying to care for someone and show them that caring for them is more than um, just acting to end everything. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around this in the Netherlands, as you probably know, and in the state of Oregon and in the United States, and a lot of it comes around about quality of life, you know. And I think quality of life for each person is completely different, and I think that's setting a blanket rule that this person is severely disabled or this person can't get out of a chair, their quality of life is very poor, is completely wrong. I have many patients who are severely disabled with symptoms and can do very little, and are extremely happy with their lot in life. And I have other people who have 
much less severe disease but are very unhappy with how things are. So I think making some sort of blanket judgment that, oh, they're not very well, something should be done, I think is deeply dangerous. Deeply dangerous. And I think it's our job to demonstrate to people that we still care for them when they're unwell, when they're very unwell, and that compassion and care are not just there when we're treating patients ordinarily, but they should be there right at the end, particularly right at the end. I'm going to hand this microphone to Andrew and uh, we'll give you the opportunity to ask one or two questions if you care. But maybe just before we do that, Stanley, um, picking up on what Mark has said, you, you maybe have been working with parents who have been in the forefront of new um, advances, perhaps with IVF treatment, and some of those are successful and perhaps others not so. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I suppose I've, I've noticed a, a, a big change in um, things over the last, you know, five, ten years. Um, as I think the, the, uh, the uh, technological uh, advances have, have uh, uh, gone on with, with reproductive technology. Um, a lot more infants are being born uh, prematurely or um, with... Uh, difficulties at birth that perhaps weren't recognised 10 or 15 years ago um, when the technology was still in its inf infancy. And it has led to um, a number of situations where um, I've been involved in counselling parents antenatally um, who haven't gone through a process of um, IVF and uh, ended up with, say, a multiple pregnancy, which in itself then um, puts at risk the success, in inverted commas, of that pregnancy, um, they then come asking for uh, information about fetal reduction. Um, and it's certainly, it's certainly something that I feel um, very uh, uh, ill-qualified Ill or, you know, very, uh, I find it very difficult to, to deal with those situations. And that's where um, I find you know, that having those discussions um, clashes with, with, with my beliefs as a, as a Christian. Um, and yet, I have to deal with, with parents in that situation because that's what, that's what I'm, I'm paid to do, that's what, that's what my job is. And I certainly find it, it, it very, very difficult. Um, and what I, on a couple of occasions when I've been asked uh, about uh, termination and, and so on, um, what I have found is that people are coming as if termination is an easy answer. And um, I've certainly, having read around the area and so on, uh, been in a position where I've, I've felt um, that it's important that those folks are informed about um, that which comes along with termination uh, in terms of the emotional trauma and the psychological trauma because that's often under, underplayed in terms of a quick and easy fix. Um, and I think some people find themselves or feel themselves forced in situations where they feel that that's their only option. Um, and uh, I certainly find myself in situations where I've actually been able to say to people, you know, you do actually have other options here. Um, some of you will have heard of, uh, of a guy, uh, Dickie Barr, who um, runs the organisation Love for Life, uh, and they, I, I don't know uh, Dickie Barr, but I've, I've heard him speak, um, and he provides a, a very, um, uh, it's just a wonderful service, where he has practical support available for uh, helping um, girls who find themselves in undesired situations, unplanned situations, where they're contemplating that type of decision. Um, a lot of it comes to me because people have gone through IVF and so on, uh, where it obviously has been an intentional thing. Um, but I think, you know, for us as a church, for us as a Christian witness, um, I think, it, it, you know, having a facility like that or um, developing more uh, people who are, who are prepared to, to get their hands in those sorts of, uh, dirty in those sorts of issues um, is, is a wonderful area of service for the, for the church. Um, skills that I certainly don't have, but I'm sure there are people, you know, in and around 
um, this area, this land, who, who do have those sorts of skills. Um, and I think if, if my observations over the last five or ten years are such that it's, it's, it's increased, I can only foresee that it's going to become more and more of an issue. Um, so I think that's going to be difficult. If you'd like to ask a question, then just raise your hand. You do a very difficult job, <clears throat> uh, and I'm sure there are situations you feel totally out of control, and that you can only do your best. Um, are there any situations that you've seen in the past where you can say, if God had not intervened in that, the situation would have been completely different? Uh, we read about miracles in the Bible. Are there modern miracles within your professions? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. I think the answer is definitely yes. There are definitely people that I have come across, I can think of at least two or three, for whom we had expected there was only going to ever be one outcome from the beginning, and at least one of those people was completely restored to health. Uh, not through anything that I or any of my colleagues did. Um, and I can think of other people who have had uh, unexpectedly good results, again, without any direct um, specific intervention that we uh, undertook. So I'm sure that is right. And just to go back to the students with Frank, we are running a thing, um, a course for the students now called Wholeness of Healing. And in that, we're trying to introduce them to the other aspects of of being a person and the other aspects of disease, I suppose, um, rather than just a simple medical model of, you know, physical problem, physical solution, we're also looking at emotional, uh, social, psychological and spiritual issues in healthcare. And I think if you're attuned to these things, you will definitely come across situations um, where I think the word miracle probably is right. Um, I, can, I can certainly think of, a, of, of uh, two occasions where um, we had uh, come to a position where we had said to um, uh, parents that there was nothing further that we could do um, and fully expected um, the, the patient to, 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 to pass away um, you know, over the, the, the coming few hours uh, where that didn't happen. Um, and again, I've, I've no medical explanation for those uh, for those situations, um, and uh, I'll be quite happy to to uh, to see that as an intervention of, of God's grace. Yeah. Yeah. There are situations sometimes between a childbirth especially, between the mother surviving or the child surviving. And some faiths say, save the child at all costs. What would be your position if you knew that the mother had the best chance of living and yet you were being forced almost to save the child or try and save the child? Thanks for that. After this, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suppose there, there's, there's. Um, I, I can't think I've been in a situation where I personally have had to choose between uh, one or t'other. Um, as, a, as a pediatrician, as an anatologist, um, my, my job is to is is to look after uh, the baby. Um, and I have obstetricians and adult physicians like Mark to, to look after mum. But certainly there have been situations where um, mum has had an illness, where um, in order to gain treatment for that illness, um, early delivery um, has, has been required. Um, in fact, it, it's, it's happened twice in the last two or three weeks and often relates to um, cancer. Uh, in the in the in the mum, pregnancy is a um, 
is a funny state of, of health uh, in that for some mums uh, they have a, a, a genetic predisposition for want of a better word um, and in that um, period of, of pregnancy um, their whole uh, state of uh, immune system changes that makes them particularly uh, vulnerable to uh, uh, cancer uh, becoming manifest. Um, and there are situations akin to, to what you're describing where uh, mum requires treatment, but that treatment will um, uh, you know, kill the baby if the baby's not delivered. And so in those situations, uh, we have a, a series of, of um, meetings between, say, for example, the oncologist um, and the, obst the obstetric team uh, and, our, and ourselves to try and work out the, the, the best time to, to, um, to get mum the treatment that she needs. Um, in legal terms, um, the, the, the baby before it's born has, has no, legal, no legal status. So it's actually very difficult to go into those, those situations um, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, uh, optimise the, the chances for, for the baby. What I can say is though that um, one of the, when I was a very junior doctor, I had one of these situations where um, the, 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 the mum was delivered uh, early at around 25 weeks gestation. And 15 years ago, that was a big deal. And we weren't able to, to, um, to save that baby. Um, and mum went on to, to, to receive the, the chemotherapy that she needed and, and survived. Um, the same situation has happened two or three times in the, in the last six months and, and twice in the last three weeks, as I said. Um, and I guess what um, encourages me is that our uh, ability to keep uh, little ones at that early gestation alive um, has improved where we can actually um, come with some sort of positive input into that situation. So we kind of go in with a win-win, win for mum and win for, win for baby. Um, but in legal terms, the, the baby doesn't have any legal status until, until birth. Um, and it can be very difficult. Certainly before 24 weeks, um, I've witnessed a couple of situations where um, effectively uh, the mum has had to receive uh, treatment and that has meant the, the death of the child and that's very difficult to deal with, not least for the mum. There's obviously been a lot of advances in medicine over the past number of years, I mean, enormous leaps forward, and that sometimes changes people's attitude towards death. Uh, I don't know whether you've experienced a change in people's attitude, uh, but with modern medicine, people nearly feel that they have a right to keep on living and that something can be done. What is your experience of people's attitudes towards death? Yeah, um, that's a very good point, Kurt, and it, 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 it is absolutely right. In fact, I think there's been a, a general sea change in the view of, of health care generally, and I think, uh, I think there's always been a, pers I think there's been a recent perception that if something can be done, it always should be done. And um, I think we in the medical profession are not blameless in this. Um, I think we often see if a, a patient does, if a patient dies, that we see that that's some sort of failure on our part. And of course, people shouldn't die from routine operations, etc. But when people are gravely ill and it looks likely that they are going to die, it's a little arrogant of us to think that we're able to step in and prevent someone's death if it's been ordained that that is the time that's, that someone is going to die. So this does uh, cause some very painful conversations with, with people in terms of um, what to do when they are gravely ill and whether to keep pushing all the time with very little prospect of success or not. Interestingly enough, my own experience has been that the vast majority of people are extremely realistic and the vast majority of patients that I deal with at least do not want to spend weeks and weeks with very, very intensive and often very unpleasant um, procedures and interventions with a very small hope at the end of that of, 
of, of any benefit. Um, but it is an individual decision. Um, as a Christian, you've always got to err on the side of preserving life if there's any uncertainty as to what has to be done. I think, I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but it is becoming increasingly difficult. We aren't as bad as the United States yet, where everything is, it's routine to do everything to everyone, irrespective of whether it may or may not be in their best interests. But there's certainly a little pressure heading that direction. I think that's fair to say. Um, I think certainly we um, would uh, see over the last, again, the last 10 or 15 years, um, expectations uh, change. And often fueled by um, newspaper reports, media reports. Um, so in, in the recent couple of years, there has been um, uh, reports on babies at 23, 22 weeks uh, surviving. And we don't currently, uh, in my unit, don't offer uh, resuscitation for, for uh, uh, deliveries at 22 weeks. Um, but I've certainly been asked. Uh, and I think there is this, this, uh, this expectation that, that you describe in terms of um, death just shouldn't happen. Um, one of the, the things that I get involved with is trying to um, ensure a, a process of, of, of improvement in, in standards of care. Uh, we all have that, but I um, try and bring some um, facts and figures uh, to parents when we're, when we're dealing with things at the, at the margins of viability, just to try and place some sort of realistic um, expectation um, because everybody will remember the, the case report that, that, uh, that hit the newspapers or the, or, the, or the television screens about somebody extremely uh, small um, and they think that that's automatically going to be the, the, the situation for their, for their uh, particular little one. Um, so. The other times that I, that, that I see um, that uh, attitude um, is when it's obvious to us in the uh, nursing and medical team um, that um, the, the, the little one is, is, is in the dying process. And I think sometimes people um, ask us to keep, keep on going, keep on going uh, to the point where you re really feel that it's, it's, it's gone too far. Uh, and it isn't fair on the little one. Um, and I find those situations actually very, very difficult and very painful. Um, and sometimes I find myself being quite directive, um, saying, actually, I think it's really time to stop. Um, so I think, I think there is a change in society um, in terms of attitudes to, to death. And um, I guess we just see the, the, uh, the cool face um, uh, at that particular time. <laughs> One final question, Ruth. I was thinking on the other hand, um, the elderly or the very ill, if they request no resuscitation, is that always respected when they do die? Uh, if, if someone um, has the legal, um, what's called capacity to make a decision, then we have to respect that decision. So there is. Uh, autonomy to make a good decision and a bad decision. So if we think someone's making a bad decision, then we will explain to them what we think our advice is, but we have to, we have to respect what, what people say. I think the problem comes when things happen unexpectedly, and then sometimes uh, there's nearly always a, a default position to do something, which I think is obviously good in general, but can lead to problems in patients who have perhaps expressed to someone else that they didn't want anything done. But yes, it should, at least in theory, it should always be respected. If someone who is competent um, makes a decision, it should be respected whether you agree with the decision or not. I'm going to ask you a question just as we begin to close, and that is, um, with all this hard work and everybody's so somber listening to everything tonight, how on earth do you relax? <laughs> um, yes. um, I think it, uh, I think it is, um, it's important to develop some sort of compartmentalizing st sort of strategy to try and 
give your best when you're at work, but try and step back from that when you're not at work. And um, I think Andrea and the family is a very natural antidote for me. And um, no matter what sort of day you've had, when you open the door at night, there are people wanting their tea and there are people needing their jammies on and there are people wanting a story read. And I think that's a very natural, a very natural antidote and um, a very effective one for me, I think, most of the time. The short answer is with difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th I think family keeps you, uh, keeps you on the ground. Um, I find at times I just need to get a complete break, so I, I, I try and play golf, albeit badly, but that's, that's um, and a bit of cycling, just getting some exercise and trying to get fresh air, basically. What effect are the cuts going to have on your work? Any politicians in here? <laughs> um, I, I think I, th I think it's it's going to be very difficult. Um, I know that uh, all of us, no matter what um, branch of, of, of public service, um, we we all feel um, under resourced currently. Um, so to have cuts on, on top of that. Um, is um, I, I think it's going to make uh, to be very difficult. Um, I think there's either certainly um, going to be situations where um, we aren't going to be um, to be able to, to develop services um, either at all or um, at the speed that we think they should be required. For me, in my situation, um, I've been looking forward to a new women and children's hospital for as long as I can remember. And I've pretty much accepted now that I'm not gonna see that in my professional uh, life, which I think is a big shame. Um, so I think there'll be concrete, ex literally concrete examples um, of where the economic uh, situation is going to affect the delivery um, of healthcare. Um, that will be one example, I suppose, in my situation. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think people who have an acute, life-threatening illness in my own specialty will probably still get a very good service. But I think people who are likely to have chronic, long-term debilitating decision, uh, uh, diseases are probably going to find that things aren't as good as they or we would like. I think when the ax comes down, there will be those things which have to be protected. and. I, th I think those will be the high profile things that everyone knows. Um, and just going back to Kirk's point, I mean, uh, managing expectation, I think, is going, to be, is going to be very important. I think we're going to be the ones who are going to be asked why everything isn't good when it should be good. And um, those are also going to be difficult conversations, I think. We're in uh, these gentlemen's debt, yes? Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Stanley, for what you've shared with us. We really appreciate all that you are, uh, all that you bring to your work, and it encourages us in our prayers for you, Thank you. Uh, throughout the week. And Stanley, I know you're going straight into work. Uh, yeah, I have to go and do a word right now. So. Okay, let's just pray together. Gracious Lord, thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together uh, chatting together in um, a context of faith. Thank you for the Lord Jesus and thank you for all that he means to us and thank you that he makes all the difference uh, to issues of life and issues of death. Thank you that he is the one who gives inspiration and he is the one who controls uh, all things. And thank you that we have been called to various spheres of responsibility. And as uh, Mark and Stanley have shared with us something of their ordinary work, we pray, our gracious Father, that they will know the sustenance and encouragement and enabling of your Holy Spirit in the uh, good times and in the dark moments. And our Heavenly Father, enable them in their various responsibilities with the different uh, issues that face them uh, uh, day by day, 
that they will know your care and your provision and your grace. Thank you for your goodness to us in so many ways. Thank you for medical staff for whom we have huge uh, uh, admiration and, and appreciation. And we commit uh, uh, Mark and Stanley to you now, thanking you for our time together this evening. And we bless you in Jesus' name.